so how, how does it feel to know that you are a district court judge? Yeah, I feel blessed and I'm honored um, to be in this position. I'm thankful to the governor for appointing me. Um, I'm thankful for the judge. Judge Wilson and Judge Allen that swore me in. And again, I'm just feeling blessed to be a district court judge in North Carolina. Yeah, so a little bit of a different path for you because Governor Cooper saw this vacancy and he said, I want Erica Brandon to fill this role. Yes, yes. Um, as you know, I ran last year for this seat. Um, I lost and the person, um, Mike Ginger, that won, he aged out in May. And as you said, there was a vacancy open and thankfully um, the governor appointed me for that position. So I'm thankful. Does that change the way you view the office at all? No, I mean, the same seriousness that I would have took to take the office on January 1st is the same seriousness that I took the oath in July. Um, it's the same seat, same position, serving the same people. Um, I don't see it any different, so no. How often are you in Rockingham County and how often are you in Caswell? Well, it's four judges here in Rockingham and Caswell County. So we're in Rockingham County for three weeks and we rotate to Caswell County for one week. So actually this is my week to be in Caswell County. The other three weeks I will be in Rockingham County. Gotcha. And you've been on the job for how many months? I started in July, so August and September, so about two months. <laughs> I know you're still figuring the office space out and everything. Exactly. Um, but you're here. I am. I'm thankful to be here. I was watching the video from your swearing in. You talked about your faith a lot. How big of a role does that play in this job for you? A huge part. Um, for the first six months, I can only do civil because I'm coming from the DA's office, so I can't do any criminal right now. So most of the cases that I'm dealing with is child custody, um, child support, a lot to do with children. And I just feel that, or the law says, it's the best interest of the child. And so my faith works with that a lot um, to make sure that I'm making the right decision for that child. I pray about a decision before I make it and make sure, of course, that it's in accordance with the law, but make sure that it's in fact the best interest of the child. And my faith has sustained me through the loss. It has um, sustained me through the wins. So my faith has kept me grounded and, and made me the person I am today. Right. right. Maybe it wasn't in the plan for you to win. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so God had a, a different path and a different plan for me. And I'm just on for the journey. I can imagine it's hard not to think about your own family when you're hearing these family cases, these child cases. Um, does that ever come to mind for you? It does. It does. I have two children. I have a four-year-old daughter named Justice and a two-year-old son named Jordan. And some of the things that children deal with, I, I wouldn't want for my children. Um, so, of course, I think about my, my kids when I'm hearing these cases and hearing what some of these kids I've gone through, it, it breaks my heart. So being a mom does come into play with this. Being a female, being a woman, I think comes into play a lot with this. Um, what do they think about this? Your family, your kids? I don't know. I know my two-year-old, Jordan, has no clue <laughs> what is going on. Um, my daughter knows that I am a judge, and that's about it. Um, because at home, I'm just mommy. Um, the same that I was last year, the year before, that, that's it. When I'm home, that's who I'm with. I'm with my husband and my kids, and we're just any other normal family watching Sesame Street and everything else. So I'm not judge at home, I'm mommy, so. Different story here. Yes, <laughs> very different story here. So I like the outlet of going home and, and being just that mom and that wife. Do you feel the distinction between the different hats you wear, the mom hat, the wife hat, the judge hat, the advocate hat, do you feel the distinction or has it almost become one? I think it always has become one because now that's who I am. Um, I just wear those different hats at different times and in different points during the day, but all of that is who makes Erica. Um, and I just try whatever hat I'm wearing at that particular time to be the best Erica that I can be. So whether I'm wearing the judge hat that day, still being the best Erica, whether I'm being the advocate, best Erica, the best wife, the best mom, 
and compiling all of that together to make one whole person of Erica that just wears those different hats during the day. Um, a historic position, mm -hmm. first African American female judge in Rockingham County. What comes to mind? Actually, the first African American period, husband, I mean, excuse me, man or woman. Um, I think every person deserves a position at the table, whether it's African American, whether it's female, um, and for children to see that if, whether you're this little brown boy or this little brown girl, um, that you can be in this position too. So I think it brings realness and reality to it to see someone that looks like you in a particular role. And until now, Rockham County has not had that. So I take that with great stride, I take it with great pride, but I also want to make sure that I make wise decisions and that I do a good job while I'm holding this position. Um, I don't want to let anyone down. I want them to know that I'm trying my hardest to do what I do and do it well. So. You mentioned, you know, it gives, it, it's representing. It's a representation to another generation who may see this and think, oh, if she can do it, that means I can do it. Would you say it also brings a new level of representation to the people of Rockingham and Caswell County who are on trial? Oh, absolutely. Um, you're supposed to be tried by your peers and we try our best with the jury system to make sure that each defendant is tried by their peers and is represented in the community. But when you come to court and civil cases such as child custody, these cases really matter. Your children matter to you. And so they should be representative of the community as well. So now Rockingham County has an African American on the seat and also they have another female judge. Um, both of those need to be represented as well in the community because we represent the community, we are the community, so why aren't we represented on the bench? We should be as well. But in that same token, regardless if we represent or that people see me as an African American, sees me as a female, I still have to do the right thing regardless of that. What do you mean by that, regardless of that? Meaning that just, I'm, I'm African American, I'm a female, but at the end of the day I have to follow the law just if there was a white male at the bench or whoever else is at the bench, I still have to follow the law. And I can't look at race or gender to determine that. So that's what I mean. So some strides being made with representation as far as <laughs> who's sitting on the bench, but still, you know, we were talking about these numbers earlier, 9% in North Carolina, 9% of judges are African-American women. Um, maybe 30% are women in general but the majority still white men. Um, what do you think can be done to close that gavel gap? First of all, we have to run for these seats. Um, more African-Americans have to stand, step up, not only African-Americans, but more females have to step up and run. And then when they run for these positions, people have to vote for them. If they are the most qualified, if they represent what you represent, um, as a voter than to vote for these people. But first of all, we have to get ourselves in those positions to be able to run for these positions and then we have to get the voters to vote for us um, so that we can represent these people, 9%, 30%, so that these numbers can in fact increase. So, yeah. what, what do you, you hope, hope to bring, bring to the bench that maybe hasn't been here before? Well, I come from the district attorney's office. Um, I'm hoping to bring my experience that I've had there. I'm hoping to bring my faith that I have that have, has grounded me. I'm hoping to bring all of those things, my experiences, um, to the bench and hoping that I can see it in a different position or a different light than maybe other judges cannot because of my experiences. Um, and that's what I'm hoping that I can bring that's different. How many years were you with the DA's office? If I had stayed there to October, it would have been 10 years. So I was there a little shy of 10 years. And what DA's were you office. doing before that? Um, before that, I worked at a private law firm in Casco County. And before that, I had just come out of law school. So, so most of my career has been in the district attorney's office. 
And law school was locally too? I went to North Carolina Central University. Okay, so in, in Durham, okay. Mm -hmm. I was about to say Raleigh, but. Yeah, in okay. Durham, and I went to UNCG for undergrad. Gotcha, mm -hmm. I think I got those two switched. That's okay. Um, where are you from originally? I'm from Caswell County, a very, very, very small place called Milton, North Carolina. So I'm trying to put Milton on the map, yes. Oh, we can do it. <laughs> we can do it. Yes. Okay. Yes. Very cool. What's next for you? Hoping that I can continue to grow as a judge. Um, I absolutely love my job here as a district court judge and hoping that I can be elected in 2022, looking towards um, that mark and just continue to bring what I have to the table. So, and be a productive citizen. <laughs> Great. Anything else you want to add? Just want to say thank you to everyone. Again, thank you to Governor Cooper for giving me this opportunity to serve the people um, of Rockham County and Caswell County. Thank all my supporters. Just thank everyone for everything. Ryan, no questions? I thought you were keeping the hard balls back there. <sighs> <laughs> Any of them I need to just scratch because no, I'm so nervous. Oh my gosh, no. So what do you think, I mean, what do you think is like the best case you've ever tried when you were DA, when you were a private attorney? What do you, what's like, if someone said, like, landmark of your career before becoming this judge, what would it have been? It would have been in 2013 when I tried um, a sex offender. Um, and I guess I shouldn't say sex offender. He's a sex offender now, but he wasn't at that time. Um, he had <clears throat> been charged with uh, molesting his girlfriend's daughter, who was mentally challenged. She was 13, but had the mental ability of a five or six year old. Um, and she quite didn't understand what was going on with her. Um, and being able to give her justice at the end, um, he was sentenced, the jury found him guilty and he was sentenced to 40 to 49 years. And again, with her mental capacity, when I told her that, she did not quite understand what I was saying. But I was able to tell her that um, when he gets out, it will not work anymore. And she looked at me and she burst out crying. And that boy, um, and let me know that what I was doing was real. And whether it's just one person at a time, that what we do is important. And that my job was to be the advocate and to speak for this child that could not tell what was actually going on with her and didn't know what was wrong, to be the advocate for her. So if I had to say any case, it was not a landmark case, it was that case. Because I brought justice for that child. And that's why justice is so important to me that I named my daughter Justice that next year because it's great to see when justice is in fact served. So I think that would be the case. I, I like everything that you've told me today, but the naming your daughter Justice is like my, my favorite, favorite part of this entire <laughs> conversation. That's amazing. Yes. Okay. I think we have everything we need. Uh, I do have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. You said that you've had challenges along the way. Mm -hmm. uh, as kids are growing up and obviously they're seeing you in this role and possibly looking up to you, what do you have to say when they they when they come to challenges and just because you ultimately you've you've, you've reached your net, this goal mm -hmm. you have your next goal like what do you tell the kids that are uh, that are finding difficulty or finding a problem in the path they're taking for what they want to do in life? Don't give up. You can't. Um, I've realized that every challenge, every time I've fallen, it has only made me stronger. And that each time that I had challenges, it was there for a reason. And when I look back on it, I see why. And it was there to show me that, yeah, you fail, but you can get back up again, you can start back over again. And I look back on it and I'm thankful for the times I've fallen, I'm thinking for the challenges because it prepared me for where I was going and into my next level. So I would just tell that child, that teenager, to keep going, keep striving, keep trying, because you're gonna make it. If you never give up, you're gonna make it. Um, everybody that has a success story has fallen, has had some downs in their life, but they didn't give up, and that was the difference in them versus someone that never did. 
they continued on, they kept striving, and if they continue, they will make it. I am a living witness <laughs> that you can and you will make it. So that's what I would tell them. So.